so thankful to be able to be with you tonight. I have so much to say about you, the people of this congregation. Uh, some of you I have known for a very long time. Uh, Linda Quisenberry came to me last night, I believe it was, maybe it was the night before, and she said, it's been 40 years since you baptized me. Um, and some of the others of you have similar stories, and I appreciate uh, your commitment to the Lord, uh, to your commitment to the study of the scriptures, and your loyalty to me as well. Some of you I've known for a shorter period of time in various capacities, mainly in association, I think, with this congregation, and um, I have grown to love you over the years. Many of you this week have had us in your homes. Some of you have taken us out to eat, and we have enjoyed that spectacularly. And the only thing that I regret about it is that the moments were way too few. And uh, I want to spend more time with you. And I look forward to that. Um, and I'm going to say one more thing. And that is that I appreciate uh, the support and the love and the compassion that you have manifest uh, to our son, Dan and our daughter-in-law, Jenny, and our grandchildren. You have been above and beyond uh, this kind of covenant commitment that we've talked about and graciousness, empowering. Uh, I see that in you, and I have seen that in your relationship with them. And so I am thankful to you for that. Continue to pray for us, please. Tonight, I want to talk with you about executing these principles that we've been talking about all week of covenant, commitment, empowering, and graciousness, and the closeness of our relationship with God or intimacy as we see that God has unconditionally committed himself to us, that he has graciously sacrificed the son, his own son for our forgiveness, that he has empowered us and used his uh, strength to help us to be all that we can be. And we recognize that that draws us into relationship with him. We need to take that message to the world. That's what we're in the business of doing because that's who we are. And so as I read in the text of scripture, especially in the writings of John, I hear John talking a lot about love. Sometimes he tells us to love not the world, nor the things in the world. And then sometimes he tells us that we're supposed to love the world, like God so loved the world and gave his son. So my question to you tonight is, do we love the world or not? What are we supposed to do here? Well, I think all of us recognize as we look at those texts that uh, the things that are of the world, that we're not supposed to love them, but that we are supposed to love the Lord. We're supposed to love the child that is born of God as part of our own family. And we're supposed to make the sacrifices that are associated with that love. John said, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And then John added, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, I'd like to note with you that this is not some kind of therapy, emotional concept that John is commending here. What he is focusing attention on is this self-sacrificial kind of, lie of love that gives up yourself for the other. You know, Christianity is not a religion of convenience. It is a religion of self-sacrifice. And so if we approach it from the standpoint of convenience, we're really missing the point. And we're missing the value, I think, of, our, of what the kingdom of God is and what our relationship with the Lord is. 
It's about self-sacrifice because what we're doing is we're giving ourselves for that which is the most valuable. We've been talking now about how God establishes his relationship with us. Unconditional commitment, covenant commitment. We can read about it throughout the whole Old Testament. We can talk about the covenant of circumcision as the cutting off from the world and a joining together with God in this exclusive relationship. We've talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and how that we're supposed to come out of the world and be separate because the temple of God does not have anything in common with idols. Christ doesn't have anything in common with Belial. We are to be different because of who we are as the people of God. The nation of Israel is called out of Egypt, called out of the world. The nation of Israel in Babylonian captivity is called out of Babylonian captivity, called out of the world to be separate and loyal to God. And God says, I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me. And God says, you will be my people and I will be your God in this marital, familial, sonship kind of way. We're drawn into this relationship with him. So this is the way that God established and maintained his relationship with us. And what we're talking about in this series of lessons is us modeling ourselves after the way that he establishes and maintains his relationship with us. Because Psalm 127 and verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, they're laboring in vain who build it. So we're modeling our house after the model that we see in him. I want to suggest to you tonight that our love for the Lord is to be extended into our relationships with not only people in the Lord's church, not only with regard to our family, but out into the world that we're to lay down our lives for the people that are in the world in self-sacrificial commitment as we're trying to communicate the magnificent love of our Father to the people of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot content ourselves that we are the saved and that there's no need to worry about the others. I'm afraid that sometimes we approach the church from the standpoint of it being some kind of safety deposit box. You know what happens in a safety deposit box? Whatever you put in there, when you come back, that's what you get out. The Lord's church is not a safety deposit box where we sit and wait for the second coming. The Lord's church is an organism that is designed to influence the world. We're to take this message of our Father and communicate it to everybody else in light of the fact that we are so appreciative of what he's done for us and we value that so we communicate it to other people. But the question is, do we love the world? Do we love the things of the world or do we love the people of the world? Now, maybe the better question is, how much do we love the things in the world by comparison to the way we love the people of the world? Well, see, God loves the people of the world so much that he sacrifices his son for us. And where would we be without it? So God loved the world and unconditionally committed himself to us. Look with me in the book of Romans now in chapter 5. In verse 6, beginning, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Notice the language. We're helpless and ungodly, and God gives his son for us. One will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But the point is, God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The point is, is that God has unconditionally responded to us in the giving of his son. 
while we were ungodly and while we were sinners, he has done this for us and he invites us into a relationship with him. And if he has done that for us, then how much more now that we are brought into a right relationship with him, will he respond to us in positive ways? But sometimes I'm afraid that we don't understand the severity of God, the justice or the holiness of God. I will suggest this, and that is if anyone understands the severity of his wrath, it's God. He understands the consequence of his wrath. And understanding that consequence, he loved us so much that he took the the wrath upon himself at the cross and saved us from it. Now, do you understand something about the value of the wrath and the severity of the wrath of God in light of that, what he's done? He's taken the wrath upon himself and the sacrifice of himself for our benefit. The wrath of God must be intensely severe in order for him to do that and then say that he loves us so much that this is what he's willing to do. Well, the reason why he did it is that he's not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. And the question that each of us must face is, do I love like that? One fellow put it like, I just want $2 worth of God in a brown paper bag. Not enough to explode my soul or make me love a migrant worker. Just $2 worth of God, please, in a brown paper bag. Well, God gave his son. Can we give up our prejudices? In light of the value that he's given, God gave his son. And are we looking for a bargain? How cheap is that? What does that do for the meaning of the cross and the sacrifice that Christ makes for us? What are the great commandments? To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it's interesting to me. But in John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. Now think about that for a moment. The greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And when you look in the Old Testament, this is the idea that is repeated there. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. And then in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. Well, what's new about it? You're to love like I have loved you. You are to love like I have loved you. I think that's more intense, don't you? That's incredible. And if we do not comprehend something of the value that God has placed on us, how can we comprehend the value that he places on others and take the message of the gospel to them? I like the way that Daniel I. Block said it in the New International um, Version Application Commentary. He said, until and unless Christians recover a sense of the incredible privilege of being a holy people belonging to God, the objects of his gracious election, his treasured people, and the targets of his affection, and until they recover the missional significance of this calling, the Western church will remain pathetic and powerless in the face of the challenges of our age. What's he saying? If we don't understand, we are not going to be evangelistic. If we can't comprehend what God has done for us and who we are as the people of God, yes, this whole series is about our identity, 
then how in the world are we going to reach out to others? We're not going to, we're going to be hampered in reaching out to others because we don't understand who we are as the people of God. As we love people like God loves people, we are going to be more useful for the master. And engaging the world like he did will move mountains. Oh, we are reminded of that passage in Matthew where the disciples are trying to cast out demons and that sort of thing. Jesus says, oh, you know, if you have a little more faith here, you'll be able to move mountains. I'm not sure that he's talking about taking a literal mountain and moving it over there. I'm not sure that there's really an ob objective in that. But figuratively speaking, for sure, that this faith creates magnificent changes. I mean, think about it yourself. Think about who you were before you became a Christian and the magnificent change that you have experienced as a result of that. The changes in your life, the hope that you have now that is different when you had no hope, when you were lost. And there are various evidences in the teaching of Jesus involving how he engaged the world. It's interesting to me that uh, Jesus is such a powerful storyteller. It seems like that sometimes people just can't get the message through until they hear a story. And in Luke chapter 10 and verses 25 and following, Jesus tells this story about this good Samaritan. And in the process of telling this, he answers the question of who is my neighbor? Well, we might look at the text of the um, Old Testament and say that we're supposed to love our neighbor. Well, who is our neighbor? Well, if I can narrow it down and restrict it, maybe I can justify myself for having loved my neighbor. But in this text, what Jesus does is he expands it. And interestingly, as he tells the story, it is about a Samaritan of all people who has this expansive idea about what it means to love your neighbor. He includes Jews in it of all people. And of course, he's telling the story to these Jews and he's illustrating it with a Samaritan. Well, interesting. And it implies that I am to love like this Samaritan loves. Well, if that love is supposed to be evident in caring for an individual who is beaten and robbed and left on the side of the road, how much more so if this individual is lost? If I'm supposed to love him because he's beaten and left lying on the side of the road and care for him and do something for him, what about if he's lost? He has no hope. He has no expectation of being with his father. He's not loved, at least in his understanding. How much more should I take that message of hope to that individual? Jesus engaged in communicating about this magnificence and the magnitude of this great love that we're to have for other people who are our neighbor. And in John chapter 4, it's interesting. When you give consideration to the context of the first century and the perspective about women and that kind of thing in society, and here Jesus comes on the scene. The disciples have gone away. They come back, and here he is. He's talking with this Samaritan woman. Now, notice, first, that she's a Samaritan. Secondly, that she's a woman. And thirdly, that she is a Samaritan woman. And Jesus is talking with her about spiritual things. Well, the disciples are amazed. They don't say anything, but they're amazed. <laughs> they observe that he's doing this. This is odd. This is unusual. And yet he's crossed into this transcultural kind of experience with this woman. 
you know, it's easy for us to talk with the people that we know and are familiar with and look like us and dress like us and talk like us and all that kind of thing. It's another thing to cross into another culture and to communicate the message of the gospel to those folks that are different than us, who may speak a different language, who look different, who wear different kinds of clothes and all that kind of thing, come from different backgrounds than we do, but that's the responsibility, you see, because the message of the gospel is a message of hope for all nations. For all nations. And so Jesus engages a Samaritan woman. And it's interesting that the first century disciples evidence this same kind of procedure. It's not that they didn't have a problem with it. For example, Peter was under some hesitation as he went to the household of Cornelius. Even though he's seen a vision and the Lord has sent him, he's still having some level of difficulty. When he gets to Cornelius' household, he says, in effect, why am I here? Well, Cornelius explains that he saw a vision too and that I've sent for you as a result of the instruction that I've received in this vision. And so Peter begins to open up to the possibility now that Gentiles might be included in this and it might be okay to preach the gospel to them and therefore he does. And the response by God is that these people start speaking in languages that they haven't learned and that validates for Peter and, and six other Jews that he just happened to bring along with him. I don't know if you've noticed about them, but there are six other Jews there with him. And the text indicates what hinders these from being baptized. And it's like, well, um, we can't. And it's interesting when they get back to the city of Jerusalem, they are expectant that they're going to have to explain themselves. We're going down here and speaking to these Gentiles and, and being in their household. And, and they do. And guess what? Those six Jews must be there explaining what happened. And so we couldn't prevent anything that God wanted to have happen here. We couldn't stand in God's way. And so we accepted them like God had accepted them. But that's not the end of the story for sure. In Acts chapter 15, there are further problems in accepting Gentiles, but they work through that issue as well in recognition of the fact that God had opened his door to all nations. Paul was sent to the Gentiles in particular. It's interesting to me as he's preaching to the Jews and they reject him and his message that he turned to the Gentiles. And one of the things that is interesting to me is that he quoted the Old Testament text as authority to do so. This is what the prophets said was going to take place. So he turned to the Gentiles. In that Acts 15 meeting, James and the arrest concluded that they didn't have to circumcise the Gentiles, didn't have to teach them to observe the law of Moses. In other words, they didn't have to convert to Judaism. They just converted to Christianity. And James said, with this, the words of the prophets agree. This is what God's message had always been, to engage the world and move mountains of prejudice, move mountains of difficulty, move uh, mountains of hatred and bring about peace. We have to go beyond those that are like us, folks. Now, having said that, I want you to think about where to begin. In this series of lessons, I have necessarily implied a place for you to begin. And that's with your own household. You begin there. Well, what does that look like? Well, you can read about it as you're studying through the book of Acts and into the epistles as well. There is a, a little word 
that is used in the original language in Acts and the epistles that is translated in the English translations with the word household. It's the word oikos. I'll say that so you can kind of remember that. Oikos equals household. For example, Peter went down and found Cornelius. And Cornelius had assembled his household. Well, who is that? Well, my household is, is right now, it's me and my wife. It has been me and my wife and my children. Uh, sometimes it might include somebody else that is staying with us for a period of time. That's my household. That's my immediate household. That's kind of the way we think in our 21st century society. But I want you to broaden the concept of household here on the basis of the way that Cornelius describes who it is that he has assembled to hear Peter's sermon. The text says that he called together his close friends and relatives. His close friends and relatives. Now, in the ancient world, one's oikos or household was not necessarily limited to their immediate family, husband, wife, and children. It included anybody else that might be living within that group. It might also include work associates, okay? That was part of an individual's household. I'm going to give you a way that you can remember and think about household in a New Testament context. When you think about who would come to your funeral, consider those people your primary realm of influence. If you die today, who's going to come to your funeral? I guarantee you that these are the people that you have more influence with than anybody else. This is your oikos. Begin here with bridging this relationship between your heavenly father and them. Now, these are the people that you love, and these are the people that love you. Isn't it interesting that love motivates this whole thing? Ever notice how that, um, you know, there are young people in the congregation and um, they're at that age where they're thinking about uh, dating and that kind of thing. And the next thing you know, uh, this young lady or this young man is bringing uh, someone to worship with them. The next thing you know, they're in the process of teaching them. And why is that? They're including this person in their realm of influence in their household. They're thinking about a love relationship, and look what's happening. They're communicating the message of the gospel. Now they're becoming a bridge to communicate who their father is to this other person. It's natural, isn't it? Now, there's nothing wrong with going door to door, knocking on doors, and meeting new people, and talking to them about the gospel and all that kind of thing. Nothing wrong with that. Well, let me tell you something, folks. That's a lot harder than talking to the people in your household generally that love you and that are concerned about you and recognize that you're valuable to them and they're valuable to you. Begin there. And this week, some of you have already evidenced this, haven't you? You brought friends and relatives. Let me ask you another thing. How many of you are here? Let me, let me say that another way. How many of you are a Christian as a result of some friend or relative that's influenced you? You see how that works? We're evidence of it. We're evidence of it. Well, let's capitalize on that. These are the people that we influence. These are the, the people that influence us. And we can work through these webs of influence just like it happened in the days of the New Testament. Cornelius has assembled his relatives and close friends to hear whatever it is that Peter has to say from the Lord. 
Lydia and her household, the jailer and his household are baptized. On and on we could go. We have great opportunity to teach our households through these natural web relationships. But if we don't do it here, what that means is, if we're going to communicate the gospel to someone, we have to do it through some kind of cold contact, knocking on doors or something like that. Well, nothing wrong with that. Not at all. But I'd like to suggest to you that we're already in a position to powerfully influence those in our household. We're already doing that. Let's do it for the Lord. Let's do it for the Lord. We do it for the kind of car we want to buy or they want to buy, the kind of house they want to live in, all that kind of thing. We talk to them about it. Let's talk to them about the Lord. Let's talk to them about our Father. Let's be the bridge that reaches out to them. If they come through this door, understand that that is a good person to talk to about their heavenly father. Don't you let them come in here and be ignored. Because when they came through that door, they were saying, I'm interested in the things of God. Okay? Now, when they come through that door, they may look different than you. That's okay. They may wear different kinds of clothes than you. That's okay. They may have tattoos. They may have piercings. That's okay. Different culture. It's out of the world, and we're in the business of taking people that are in the world and teaching them about their heavenly father, our heavenly father. Let's do it by including them into our household. I commend you for what you're doing with your children. These right here, I am impressed with you. Notice that they're up here in front. Up here in front. What that says to me is, yes, they're my cheerleaders. And I love it, but it's not just me that they're cheering on. It's the message, you see. You're a powerful influence, very powerful influence on all these other people here and me. Thank you. Now, You know, this whole idea of communicating our father and communicating his heritage to us is something down at Fort Logan that we've capitalized on over the years. And one way that we have capitalized on that is in our curriculum for uh, the young people. Um, there is a curriculum out there known as our spiritual heritage. Isn't that interesting? Well, the whole Our Spiritual Heritage curriculum is designed around this kind of idea that we need to understand that people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and all those others are part of our spiritual heritage. And a lot of times what we do as 21st century Christians is we kind of create this separation between us and all these other people back here. Ladies and gentlemen, they are our forefathers. They is us. We can search our lineage all we want to and talk about our grandfathers and our grandmothers and how they're kin to Abraham Lincoln and all that kind of thing and all that's wonderful and great. But ladies and gentlemen, we are kin to Abraham. He's our father. This is our lineage. And when we look at all these genealogical records back in the Old Testament, understand that that's who you are. These are our people identifies who I am. And I'm the bridge that communicates this to the world. 
because I'm communicating to the world that this is who they are too as they come into the family of God. Those that are loyal and devoted because of his commitment, his graciousness, his work of empowering us and helping us to be all we can be. Now, having said that, let's go one step further. Since we're working on our household and that kind of thing, let's work to enlarge our household. What do you mean by that? Well, there are always people that we come into contact with in life. And somehow or the other, it's like um, we are able to develop some kind of connection with them. Now, I've mentioned to you that uh, over the past 20 or so years that um, Phyllis and I have been able to go to Columbia, South America and, and do some work there. And in the process of doing that, when we first started going, it had to do with young people. You know, we'd have a camp and study with these young people. But you know what? After 20 years, a lot of them grew up. As a matter of fact, all of them did. But what I learned from that experience is that some of these young people uh, kind of adopted me. Well, I kind of adopted them back. So to some of them, I am known as dad too. That's dad with the number after it. What does that mean? Well, I'm not trying to replace their daddies, but I want you to know that I'd like to include you in my family, in my household, all right? Now, they may call me from Columbia and talk with me on the phone. They may FaceTime with me. And I really enjoy it. It's a blessing. It's really a blessing. And it's a blessing to see them from the time, let's say, that I first met them, maybe when they were four years old, and now they're 24. I've been able to observe some of them getting married and having families of their own. What a blessing! Sometimes they've got a problem. And if they can't necessarily talk to their biological dad, sometimes they'll call me. What a blessing. What an honor. But what a level of influence they've allowed me to have in their life. I'm thankful. But in that way, we can enlarge our household. So look out amongst you to young people. You know, when you come into your teenage years, there come some times that you just can't talk to your parents all the time. How wonderful it would be if you had somebody that was loyal to you, that was a Christian, that you could just go and talk to. Well, you can be that. If you enlarge your household, embrace them, bring them in, make yourself vulnerable. Oh, they'll make themselves vulnerable to you. Embrace them. Let them be a part of your household and of your influence. Do it deliberately. But there's a problem. Our attempts to reach the world by relationships and direct communication is marred by our sin. We know that evangelism begins with our own personal relationship with the Lord. Let these words be on your heart and in your mind and in your soul. Let them be on your hand and let them be on your forehead. Let them be on the doorposts of your house. Yes, it begins with the one that is in our heart. And it's out of that heart that the message is able to be communicated to our family and the congregation and it extends into the world. But our influence is marred let me call to your attention some of the things that mar our influence. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 10 and following. One of the things that mars our influence is materialism. 
When it comes about that the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied, then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name, and you shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you, for the Lord your God is in the midst of you as a jealous God. Jealous like a husband is jealous, huh? He wants an exclusive relationship with you. And if you allow these things that he's blessing you with to get in the way of your relationship with him, well, don't do that. If you do it, it's going to mar your influence. It's going to take you into the world if you're not careful. Don't forget the Lord. But then look in Deuteronomy chapter 7. It's interesting that Moses warns about these kinds of things in verse 3 and 4. He says, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them, that is, these foreign nations, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. Ladies and gentlemen, worldly influences mar the impact that we can have with the world. Now, it's obvious in this text that the nation of Israel is to be intermarried with the people of God, not the people of the world. Sometimes I fear that we have um, not been bold enough to focus attention on this marriage relationship. And we've allowed our society to focus us and our desires and our pleasures and all that kind of thing to the point that Christians allow themselves to be influenced by the people of the world and intermarry with them, and that the Christian is taken off into the world. That's the warning here in this text. Be careful, folks. If you want godly offspring, be careful about who you marry and who their father is. Are you with me? You remember John chapter 8? Be careful about who their father is. If you marry a child of the devil, your father-in-law is going to be a problem to you. Be careful, folks. Another thing that interferes in our work of influencing the world, and that is pleasure seeking. It's interesting in the New Testament in James chapter four, that James talks to these Christians about this very thing. James chapter four, what's the source? He says of quarrels and conflicts among you is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members. You lust and do not have, and so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And then he says, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Come out and be separate is what he's saying, isn't it? You've got to be separate. Every sin that we commit diminishes our influence to some degree. So what we need to do is we need to sharpen our focus and discipline ourselves for the cause of Christ. When we do that, when we do that, what can we expect to have happen? Well, some are going to be receptive to the message of the gospel. They're going to have soft hearts as a result of their understanding of the unconditional commitment that God has made to them and the graciousness and the empowering. They're going to be soft to that, and they're going to respond in trusting in the Lord, and they're going to respond with faith. On the other hand, 
Some are going to be intolerant. And we need to recognize this. This is not all uh, pie in the sky and glory by and by. There is difficulty associated with communicating the message of the gospel. Some are going to respond with intolerance. Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city of Lystra as dead. A friend of mine asked me, was Paul actually resurrected before he went back into the city? And I'm not sure. I don't know. But he was dragged out of the city and left for dead. Jesus was crucified, but this is not a religion of convenience, is it? It's a religion of self-sacrifice. But we are not willing that any should perish. And although we are praying for the coming of the Lord, we realize that that's not an advantage for those that are perishing. And so, as Paul put it, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, my question to you tonight is this. Have you given yourself to this cause? It's going to cost you everything. But it's the greatest cause. If there's anything worth dying for, this is it. How do I know that? Well... God sent his son for it. It must be that valuable to him. It must be valuable enough for the son for him to die for it. Ladies and gentlemen, we honor those people that are willing to make life sacrifices. Do we honor those that are members of the body of Christ that are willing to make life sacrifices? This is the most important cause that there is. It's worth giving your life for. It's worth giving your life to. And that's what this whole message of the gospel calls on us to do, isn't it? To give our life. To give our life for these people that are lost in the world that were like we were lost in the world. And now we have learned the meaning of life. And now we understand that we've got this purpose. And now we have something to live for. And now we have this work to accomplish. And now we have something that is so valuable that we'll do anything for it. We will make financial sacrifices. We'll sacrifice our time. We'll do things that are inconvenient to us. We'll actually give our lives for the cause of Christ. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There it is. Opportunity is yours tonight. Now, I realize I'm not asking you to do something that's easy. The Lord is asking you for your life. That's the invitation. Will you give your life to the Lord? Will you live for him? Will you make yourself a sacrificial offering to accomplish his work? It's worth it. Do you need to be buried with your Lord in baptism? Isn't that a fitting kind of image to use here? In our baptism, we give ourselves away to him. He raises us to walk in newness of life. He's now in control of our life. We give our lives to him. If you need to do that tonight, won't you come forward as together we stand as we sing?